Okay, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone, and welcome to our colloquium of the Physics and Astronomy Department of the University of Padova. So it is a great honor and also a great pleasure for me to introduce to you today Professor Takaki Kajita from the uh, Institute of Cosmic, uh, uh, Cosmic Ray Research of the University of Tokyo uh, for his colloquium today. So Professor Kajita is a highly re, uh, re, 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 new, known and renowned scientist. So an introduction is uh, certainly not necessary, but still, please let me say a few words about his career and also a few words about the topic of today before we uh, start. So Professor Kajita studied at the Saitama University and the University of Tokyo in Japan. He received his doctorate in 1983. And this doctoral advisor was the future Nobel laureate uh, Masatoshi Kaji, uh, Koshiba. He uh, was affiliated um, uh, at the Institute for Cosmic Ray Research of the University of Tokyo since 1988. And he became an assistant professor in 1992 and full professor in 1999. He became director at the Center for Cosmic Neutrinos at the Institute for Cosmic Ray Research in 1999 and in, 19, in 12, uh, 2015, he became director of the Institute for Cosmic Ray uh, Research. Since uh, uh, 2020, he is president of the Science Council of Japan, and he received a very large number of prestigious acknowledgements and awards. So I won't even try listing them. Uh, he also received a number of laurea, so namely a master degree honoris causa, uh, I want to mention the one from University of Padova uh, in 2016, but also a year later from the uh, Federico II University of Naples, as well as in Perugia, and the list is actually longer. Uh, today, in his colloquium, he will address the uh, physics of neutrino oscillations in the uh, standard model of particle physics, uh, there are three different types, what are called flavors of neutrinos. Uh, but using the Super Kamiokande facility in Japan in the late 90s, Professor Takaki Kajita was leading the international team that was uh, detecting neutrinos created in the interactions of cosmic rays in the Earth's atmosphere. And through those measurements, a number of anomalies um, were um, observed which were explained by neutrino oscillating between the different uh, flavors, between the different types. This implies that neutrinos must have mass and the standard model, however, predicts neutrinos to be massless particles. And this discovery leads to the necessity of uh, revising the standard model of particle physics. So Professor Takaki Gajita was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics for this discovery in 2015 with the motivation for the discovery of neutrino oscillations, which shows that neutrinos have mass. And we will hear the full uh, passionate stories about it today. So before we start, please let me give just a few little technical instructions for people attending uh, the webinar. You have the possibility to uh, ask questions or type comments, and you are more than warmly welcome to do so. For doing that, you need to use a little button called Q&A, or in Italian would be D-A-R, so questions and answers. Uh, please type there your comments, your questions, and I will take care of reading them, and they will be addressed at the end of today's colloquium. So we are ready to start. Professor Kajita, please feel free to, to start. Thank you very much. Hi, thank you very much for the kind introduction. And also I'd like to thank you for the kind invitation to this seminar. Well, let, first let me share my slide. Okay, um, today I'm going to talk about oscillation neutrino physics, or maybe more exactly, I'm going to talk about neutrino oscillation experiments. Okay, this is the outline. 
Um, first, I'm going to introduce neutrino problems. Then I want to discuss neutrino oscillation studies. First one was nu mu to nu tau. The second one, nu e to nu mu plus nu tau. And the third one is the third oscillation channel. Well, essentially this part is the present status. Then I want to briefly discuss the future prospect of neutrino oscillation experiments. And in particular, I want to mention the CP violation and I'll summarize this talk. Actually, uh, here in the introduction, I found that this may be too general. I'm going to talk about Super Kamiokande, of course, but I am also going to talk about some other experiments, but I hope it is okay. Okay, neutrino problems. Well, the first problem was the solar neutrino problem. Well, we know that the sun generates energy by nuclear fusion processes. Neutrinos are created by these processes. Therefore, people believed that the observation of solar neutrino is very important to understand the energy generation mechanism in the sun. And therefore, the first solar neutrino experiment was carried out more than half a century ago. The first experiment is the Homestake experiment. And this experiment observed solar neutrinos for the first time. However, the observed event rate was only about one third of the prediction. And people didn't understand what happened. And anyway, this problem was called solar neutrino problem. And then following the initial observation, several solar neutrino experiments observed solar neutrinos. Here in the uh, left panel, I show the observation result as compared with the theoretical prediction. The vertical axis is the ratio to the standard solar model prediction. And the horizontal axis is the threshold energy. So the lowest threshold energy experiments are the gallium experiments, SAGE and Galax GNO. They observed solar neutrinos, including the fundamental PP solar neutrinos. And they observed the deficit of solar neutrinos. Then, of course, uh, I mentioned ho uh, the home stake experiment. Then at the higher energy, around say 5 MeV or so, um, there's the uh, Kamiokande experiment. And Kamiokande observed the high energy part of solar neutrinos. And the observed flux was again less than expected. So solar neutrino experiments in the 80s and 90s confirmed the deficit of solar neutrinos. Now, I want to move on to the second problem. Here, I want to discuss atmospheric neutrinos. Atmospheric neutrinos are, are created by cosmic ray interactions in the atmosphere. These cosmic ray interactions produce typically pions. And of course, pions are unstable, therefore decay to a muon. 
well, a power pi ion decay to a muon, then a muon decay to an electron. During this decay chain, uh, neutrinos are created. Anyway, in 1965, atom-sake neutrinos were observed for the first time by detectors located extremely deep underground. And one was in India, another one was in South Africa. Then, in the 70s, newly proposed grand unified theories predicted that protons should decay with a lifetime of about 10 to 30 years. Actually, this number, 10 to 30 years, motivated proton decay experiments. And indeed, several proton decay experiments began in the early 80s. And here, I list the proton decay experiments in the 80s. Now, proton decay experiments in the 80s observed many atmospheric neutrino events. And because atmospheric neutrinos were the most serious background to the proton decay searches, it was necessary to understand atmospheric neutrino interactions. During these studies, a significant deficit of atomic muon neutrino events was observed, first in Kamiokande and also in IMB. And here I show the data from Kamiokande and IMB that are shown as mu over E ratio of the data divided by the same ratio of the Monte Carlo. So that means if the mu over E ratio of the data agree with the mu over E ratio of Monte Carlo, the data point should be consistent with the unity. However, both Kamiokande and IMB observed a significant, significantly smaller double ratio. That, that means the deficit of muon neutrinos. So this is the second problem. Well, anyway, um, about 30 years ago, um, we had, we, we, we knew the problems, but we didn't know what was going on. And in fact, we needed the next generation experiments to understand what's going on. Okay, from now on, I want to move on to the, uh, uh, to the uh, discovery and studies of neutrino oscillations. The first one is the new mutual neutral oscillations. By the way, before going to explain the experimental results, I want to briefly discuss uh, why neutrino oscillations are important. In the standard model of particle physics, neutrinos are assumed to be massless. However, of course, physicists have been asking neutrinos really have no mass. Also, it was general, generally believed that if neutrinos have very small mass, the small neutrino mass may imply physics beyond the standard model. This is called CISO mechanism. And if neutrinos have very small mass, they change their flavor while propagating in the vacuum or in the matter, namely neutrino oscillations. And for your reference, here I show the neutrino oscillation probability for the simplest two-flavor vacuum oscillation case. 
So, neutrino flavor A to neutrino flavor B oscillation probability is shown here. And well, first of all, delta M square is neutrino mass square difference. And from this, you notice if neutrino mass is smaller, you need a longer neutrino flight length to observe neutrino oscillations, or you need smaller energy neutrinos to observe the neutrino oscillations. Anyway, this tells us, this tells us, this tells us that neutrino oscillation experiments are very important. Okay, now the first experiment I'm going to talk about is Super Kamiokande. Super Kamiokande is a 50 kiloton water Cherenkov detector. It has about 40 meters in diameter and 40 meters in height. And it is located 1,000 meters deep underground. Now, in the introduction, I discussed the atom cell neutrino deficit. And in, in well, in Kamiokande and Super Kamiokande, we have been thinking what will happen if a new deficit is due to neutrino oscillations. And for this, we thought this way. These neutrinos are created by cosmic ray interactions in the atmosphere. Therefore, some of these neutrinos are created above the super Kamiokande detector, typically 10 to 20 kilometers above the detector. So these neutrinos come to the detector after traveling 10 to 20 kilometers. But this 10 kilometer or 20 kilometer could be a very short distance. Therefore, they, they may have no time to oscillate. On the other hand, these neutrinos are also created in the other side of the Earth. And these neutrinos have to travel a very long distance before arriving at the super Kamiokande detector. Therefore, these neutrinos may have enough time to oscillate. If we think this way, we can easily conclude that we should observe the deficit of upward going mu neutrinos. In fact, in Kamiokande, we tried, we tried to observe the up, up versus down asymmetry in the mu neutrino events. Uh, by the way, of course, uh, in order to know the direction of the neutrinos by the observation of the uh, muons produced by neutrino interactions, you need to use uh, relatively high energy neutrinos because um, muon direction and the neutrino direction must be almost equal. So we used much GV neutrinos. And here I show the Kamiokande result. Cosine theta one means down going neutrinos and minus one means upward going neutrinos. And black circle shows the data and the histogram shows the Monte Carlo prediction without neutrino oscillations. You notice that the Monte Carlo prediction is essentially up-down symmetric. However, data show a deficit of upward going events. Well, actually, statistically, this was not strong enough the up-down asymmetry, uh, the statistical significance of the up-down asymmetry was only 2.9 sigma. 
Therefore, this was not convincing. What data were interesting, but not convincing. So clearly, we needed a much larger detector that is Super Kamiokande. And here, I'd like to show you the um, data from Super Kamiokande in 1998. Uh, that was two years after the start of the Super Kamiokande experiment. And because of the very large mass. Even in two years of the data, Super Kamiokande was, what was, Super Kamiokande was able to show the um, static, statistically significant up-down asymmetry for muon neutrino events. Um, oh, by the way, uh, this is the copy of the presentation at the uh, Neutrino Conference in 1998. And you may notice that about 25 years ago, the technology was very much different. I, I mean, presentation technology. So everything was handwritten. Anyway, um, the bottom, pa bottom, bottom panel is for muon neutrinos. And of course, cosine theta one means down going, minus one means upward going. And the data clearly show a deficit of upward going events. So, and, and up down asymmetry was statistically significant, more than six sigma significance. So, from this up down asymmetry, together with some other supporting data, Super Kamiokande concluded that the observed Zenisang dependent deficit gave evidence for neutrino oscillations. Well, I think the physics community, neutrino physics community, was so excited since 1998, there had there have been various neutrino oscillation experiments. Here, I list the atoms fake and accelerator-based long base and neutrino oscillation experiments that have been studying neutrino oscillations in detail. So these many neutrino experiments have been contributing to understand the details of the neutrino oscillations. In particular, I'd like to show the uh, data from accelerator-based uh, neutrino oscillation experiments. The first one was the K2K experiment. Um, this was a long baseline experiment between KEKPS proton synchrotron and super Kamiokande. In fact, um, this experiment didn't use very high power proton machine. Therefore, the number of, uh, number of neutrino events was rather limited. But anyway, uh, K2K observed the deficit of muon neutrino events. In addition, as shown in this figure, they observed the um, distortion a kind of distortion of the um, energy spectrum of the neutrinos. Clearly, the data favors the red histogram as compared with the black histogram. The black one has no oscillations. Red one assumes neutrino oscillations. So clearly, K2K very strongly supported neutrino oscillations. The next one was the MINOS experiment. And again, well, I, I would say MINOS had much higher event statistics. And again, MINOS observed energy dependent deficit of muon neutrinos. 
And the present generation experiments are T2K and NOVA. Uh, these experiments are very interesting because the neutrino energy spectrum is tuned so that the experiment should be able to observe the maximum oscillation effect. And indeed, uh, both experiments observed really significant deficit of muon neutrinos. And the energy dependent deficit was just consistent with the neutrino oscillation ex expectations. Well, clearly, uh, muon neutrino deficit can be very well explained by new mu to new tau oscillations. However, if the oscillation is new mu to new tau, one should be able to observe the appearance of tau neutrinos. In this, indeed, this was achieved. The opera experiment, now this is a dedicated experiment to observe uh, tau neutrino appearance. Um, in opera experiment, um, they observed the appearance of new tau, and the statistical significance was more than five sigma. In addition, atmospheric neutrino experiments, Super Kamiokande and Ice Cube had a dedicated uh, tau neutrino appearance analysis. And both experiments observed evidence for tau neutrino appearance. Well, unfortunately, these experiments are unable to find a very clear tau candidate. Therefore, they rely on the statistical analysis. But anyway, uh, both experiments and the, the data from these two experiments are just consistent with the tau neutrino appearance. So from these studies, we can safely say that the oscillation is the new mu to new tau. Okay, now I'd like to move on to the second oscillation channel, new e to new mu to new tau. Of course, the uh, as uh, well as I discussed at the introduction, there was solar neutrino problem. About 30 years ago, we didn't know if the deficit of solar neutrinos are due to neutrino oscillations. Um, well, to, to understand what happened in solar neutrinos, there was a um, great idea proposed by Harv Chen in 1985, um, he proposed to observe the total neutrino flux and the electron neutrino flux separately by a single detector. And for this, he proposed a large heavy water detector, a heavy water Cherenkov detector. If one, use, if one uses heavy water, then we expect new E interaction, which is a charged current interaction. Therefore, um, there will be an electron produced by a, a neutrino interaction. In addition, neutrino could disintegrate a deuteron and therefore, if we are, we are able to observe this neutral current event, uh, we should be able to observe the total neutrino flux. Unfortunately, if you look at this figure, neutral current, uh, you realize that the final state is a neutrino, a neutron plus a proton. 
naively, you do not expect to observe Cherenkov radiation from these particles. That means, naively, it is not possible to observe neutral current interactions in heavy water detector. However, people had a very good idea to observe this, uh, these neutral current interactions. And I'll come back to this point later. Anyway, uh, the idea by Hub Chen was realized by the snow experiment. Uh, snow was a one kiloton heavy water detector. You can see in this photo that heavy water was contained in this flasco. Now, I mentioned that naively we could not be able to observe, naively we would not be able to observe um, neutral current interactions, but well, people had very various good ideas to observe neutral current interactions. Uh, first, people realized that neutrons are captured on deuteron. Then a gamma ray of 6.25 MeV will be uh, emitted. And of course, this uh, gamma ray is converted to E plus E minus and so on. And therefore, uh, we should be able to observe this gamma ray signal. The second idea was to put two, ton, two tons of salt to one kiloton of heavy water. And in fact, the salt has a very high uh, neutron capture cross-section. Therefore, even a two ton of salt is enough to, uh, to capture the neutron produced by neut neutral current interactions. And after the capture of the neutron, various gamma rays of total energy of 8.6 MeV is emitted. And this gamma ray, again, are converted to electrons and so on. Therefore, this gamma ray signal should be observed. And finally, um, Snow used um, helium-3 counter. Helium-3 counter is a very efficient uh, counter to observe neutrons, and therefore, with this way, um, if they put substantial number of helium-3 counters onto the uh, heavy water container, um, neutrons can be obs observed by these he helium-3 counters. So they had, all, uh, they, they had these three great idea, and they indeed observed uh, neutral current interactions. And here, I want to show you one of the results from the SNOW experiment. Um, uh, by the way, this is the plot based on the salt phase data. So in the salt phase, uh, they observed charged current interactions, neutral current interactions, and elastic scatterings. For example, by charged current interaction, um, the data constrain the new E flux, which is shown by the horizontal axis. But of course, charged current interactions have no constraint on the new mu plus new tau flux. And therefore, in the new E versus new mu plus new tau flux plane, the constraint is, uh, is the vertical uh, band. The neutral current band, uh, uh, neutral current data also constrain as shown in blue band, and elastic scattering data constrain as shown green. 
And by the way, super cameo and elastic scattering data are shown by Black. So, first of all, you notice, you notice that three or maybe four different measurements intersect at a point, and the intersect point clearly indicates non-zero nu mu plus nu tau flux. So this was clear indication that uh, the solar nu e was converted to nu mu plus nu tau. So, well, we thought that this is clear evidence for solar neutrino oscillations. However, well, to be very precise, uh, this was just a, a demonstration of the flavor conversion. And therefore, uh, we needed some other evidence that clearly demonstrate oscillations. And for this, um, another experiment, Kamland played a very important role. Kamlan is a one kiloton liquid scintillator detector constructed at the location of Kamiokande. And when Kamlan was constructed uh, about 20 years ago, many nuclear power stations around Kamlan were located at a distance of about 180 kilometers. So people realized that it, it was possible to do a long baseline reactor neutrino oscillation experiment with Kamran. Indeed, Kamran observed um, reactor neutrinos. And here shows the energy spectrum observed by Kamran. And compared with the expectations, uh, the data showed the def energy dependent deficit. Now, well, using this data, and um, if we make um, survival probability as a function of L over E, uh, flight lengths over neutrino energy, then you notice uh, this kind of oscillation behavior, which is precisely what we expect by neutrino oscillations. So from this data, um, we were really convinced that solar neutrino deficit was really neutrino oscillations. Now, before finishing the solar neutrino part, I want to mention a recent progress in solar neutrino physics or solar neutrino measurement. The key play, key player is the Borexino experiment. And Borexino experiment observed the uh, sub MEV solar neutrinos. And here I plotted the new E survival probability as a function of the neutrino energy. These data are from Borexino and clearly the Borexino data show the energy dependent um, new E survival probability. And this is in fact just consistent with the MSW prediction, that is the um, prediction based on the uh, matter oscillation. So we are really happy to see that data are consistent with the uh, MSW prediction or matter oscillation prediction. Also, um, Borexino experiment observed the CNO neutrinos. I think this is really a 
um, um, uh, really a very important milestone to understand the uh, solar neutrinos. So there have been a lot of progress in solar neutrino oscillations and also understanding of the solar neutrinos itself. Okay, now I'd like to move on to the third oscillation channel. Well, the new Newton Newton oscillation was discovered in 1998 and in 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 20 uh, uh, 20 uh, sorry. 2001 or our earlier this century, uh, solar neutrino deficit was found to be due to neutrino oscillations, nu e to nu e to nu mu plus nu tau. Then the communities in commun communities interest was the uh, discovery of the third oscillation channel, and indeed um, these experiments observed third oscillations. Well, there, were, there are two ways to observe the third oscillation channel. One is the long baseline experiments. The primary beam is new mu, and most of them oscillate to new tau. But we, if there are third oscillation channel, a fraction of the new mu could oscillate to new e. In addition, uh, reactor experiment, relatively short baseline, one kilometer, two, 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 two kilometer, could observe the uh, third oscillation channel. So these experiments indeed observed the third oscillation uh, signals. Here, I show the data from these experiments around 2011 to 2012. So uh, first of all, accelerator-based experiments observed the appearance of the new E in the new mu beam, and the reactor-based experiments observed the deficit of anti-electron neutrinos. And so from these observations, we understood the basic structure for three flavor neutrino oscillations. Well, of course, uh, these data were more than 10 years old. And since then, these experiments have been updating, improving their data, <clears throat> and I'd like to come back to, to the most recent understanding of neutrino oscillation parameters soon. Uh, but anyway, before uh, showing this uh, most updated uh, oscillation analysis, I just want to summarize neutrino oscillation experiments. So this is the summary of the neutrino oscillation experiments. Uh, that contributed to our understanding of the so, uh, understanding of neutrino oscillations, and you notice there have been many experiments. Now, well, with these many experiments, there have been really many data, and now we understand neutrino oscillation parameters rather precisely. Here is one of the um, analysis results. And well, there are three mixing angles, theta one, two, theta two, three, and theta one, three. And there are two delta m squares, delta m to one square and delta m one, uh, one three square. And you notice that these parameters are, are have been measured rather precisely to an accuracy of 1% to a few percent. Uh, by the way, uh, I have to say that, well, of course, we understand rather precisely, but 
we still assume, um, well, actually, we still do not know if the neutrino mass has a normal ordering or an inverted ordering. That means we do not know if neutrino is the heaviest or the lightest. Anyway, um, for, uh, for uh, well, from these measurements, we know that neutrino mass is very small, probably more than 10 orders of magnitude smaller than the corresponding mass of quarks and charged leptons. Also, we know that neutrino mixing angles are large compared with the uh, corresponding quark mixing angles. Okay, that is the present status. Before finishing, I'd like to briefly discuss the future prospect. Well, here I, I just summarize partial list of the future neutrino experiments. As I mentioned, we do not know if neutrino is the heaviest or the lightest. We have to experimentally determine also, we do not know if CP is violated in the neutrino sector. That means oscillation probability nu alpha to nu beta could be different from nu alpha bar to nu beta bar. And we think this is very important because this could be related to the baryon asymmetry of the universe. Also, well, this is not not measurable by neutrino oscillation experiment, but we do not know the absolute neutrino mass. Also, so far we have been assuming three flavor oscillations, but that could be sterile neutrinos. So we have to check if there are some evidence for sterile neutrinos. Also, we'd like to know if neutrinos are myuronal particles. And for this, uh, we need neutrino neutrino rest double beta decay experiments. Anyway, from now on, I'd like to concentrate on the CP vibration in neutrino physics. Well, certainly we'd like to confirm that CP is violated in neutrino sector. Well, in fact, CP violation in the neutrino sector might be the key to understand the value asymmetry of the universe, which is called leptogenesis. So we think the measurement of CP violation in the neutrino sector must be very, very important. So in order to observe CP violation in the neutrino sector, um, there are two large projects going on. One is Dune in the United States. Another one is the uh, Kaipa Kamiokande located in Japan. With, with these experiments, we'd like to observe if oscillation of neutrinos and those of anti-neutrinos are different. And in fact, these two very large projects have very similar sensitivities. And here, I, I show the expected sensitivity of the CP violation measurement or observation. And well, if the CP phase or CP phase in the horizontal axis, and if the CP phase is a very favorite one, then both experiments would observe the CP violation at the statistical significance of, say, seven to eight sigma or so. So both experiments have very high sensitivities. Now, before finishing, I just want to mention the hyper-K experiment. Uh, well, at the introduction, 
I mentioned the Kamiokande and IMB experiments. And the present generation experiment is Super Kamiokande. And these experiments significantly contributed to the neutrino physics and astrophysics. Therefore, we think it's natural to expect another very important contribution in the next generation water Cherenkov detector, Hyper Kamiokande. And well, here I, I'd like to show you the main feature of Hyper Kamiokande. It is a very large uh, water Cherenkov detector. It is about eight times larger than Super K in the fiducial mass. And because of this very large mass, we expect many important research topics in neutrino physics and astrophysics. The construction already started in 2020. And here I show the mo most recent photo of the excavation of the Hyperkamiokande uh, cavity. Well, this photo was taken just about a week ago. And this is actually the location at the top part of the hyper -K cavity. So clearly, the excavation is going on well on schedule. And we, ex we expect the experiment will start in 2027. By the way, hyper Kamiokande is a very large collaboration, international collaboration. We have about 500 members from 21 countries. Okay, let me summarize. Neutrinos have been playing very important roles in understanding the laws of nature, in particular the laws, laws at the smaller scales. Recent discovery and studies of neutrino oscillations and the small neutrino mass will be very important to understand physics beyond the standard model of particle physics. Neutrinos with small mass might also be the key to understand the big question in the largest scale, namely the universe. Why only matter particles exist at the present universe? So neutrinos are likely to continue playing very important roles in understanding the smallest and the largest scales. Okay, that's all. Thank you very much. Okay, Professor Kajita, thank you very much for this great uh, colloquium. It was very interesting, very clear. So it was really very appreciated and enjoyable for us. I would invite everyone to ask questions or type comments. Uh, at the bottom of your screen, you should have a button called Q&A. There you can type your questions and then we will uh, read them for everybody to, to hear them. And uh, then it, there will be the possibility of a discussion. Please feel free to ask any type of questions. This colloquium is really intended to be open for everyone, not for specialized uh, uh, backgrounds. So don't be afraid of asking even uh, what you think might be a very simple question. So I can already see some questions. Um, we have a question that, first of all, thank you very much for the nice presentation. I would ask, what is your opinion on the 5 MeV reactor neutrino excess? Is it, it can be related to the presence of a four flavor one? Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Well, to be honest, I'm not updating, and therefore, Maybe my thought could be a bit old, but well, I I have been thinking that this could be the uh, could be due to the air, uh, due to the uh, flux itself. We do not understand the uh, the actual neutrino flux good enough. That is my my thinking. Uh, maybe I'm wrong, but anyway. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we have another question or comment. Uh, first of all, great talk, and thank you very much. 
And if you could explain a bit why the deficit was seen on muon neutrinos and not on other types of flavors. That was about the... Uh, um, I, I believe it's about, about the... the on atmospheric neutrinos, yes. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. In indeed, uh, what we observed was only uh, the deficit of muon neutrinos. Um, the data on the uh, uh, new E data, electron neutrino data, were essentially consistent with the expectation. And this was, this is in fact um, in very good agreement with the present understanding of the three flavor oscillations. Is it answering? I, I'm, am I answering to, to the question? Tara, please feel free to type further your question if you think uh, you want to have more explanation. And everybody, please go ahead and don't be shy in typing or asking for questions or further explanations. Okay, we have another question okay. live. So it's just a curiosity. I'm not an expert in the field. So first of all, I'd like to thank you for a very clear presentation. And then, so I'd like just a curiosity. How do you plan to measure the CP violation in your experiment? Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for this question. Uh, well, uh, first of all, um, we are going to use the uh, uh, neutrino beam created by uh, uh, accelerators. And with, with the accelerator, it is possible to produce the beam of muon neutrinos or the beam of anti muon neutrinos. Then, of course, in hyperkamiokande, we should be able to observe the um, oscillation of muon neutrino to electron neutrino and uh, anti-muon neutrino to anti-electron neutrinos. And we'd like to know if the oscillation probability are the same. And if they are different, that will be the evidence for CP violation. Okay, thank you very much. I would last, we have still a couple of minutes. So people, if you feel like typing more questions, we still have some time. And while doing that, I would like to take another opportunity. So these series of colloquia are typically addressed to students. And we do have actually an important participation today from students, which uh, makes us, of course, very happy. And uh, not only from the University of Padova, I see also participation from, from other institutions. And, you know, the story which you told us, um, of course, is a, is a summary of a very long process. It took uh, quite a while for the community to accept the, the idea that oscillations was actually the correct interpretation for a series of anomalies that was observed in the data. And clearly, the community or there were groups of people, of course, skeptical because there might have been other effects. And also because it's a collection of viewpoints involving many different experiments, many different techniques, and also looking at a common story from different windows. For example, solar neutrinos, uh, which is related to the nuclear fusion processes or at higher energies, the interactions of cosmic rays in the atmosphere, for which we also didn't have, a, let's say, the, the entire picture from the particle physics point of view, no? the interactions and such. So it was really necessary to view at a very um, complex series of, uh, how to say, ingredients of a common story, but from many different perspectives. So today, science is also being, how to say, managed possibly in a different way with respect to 30, 20, or even possibly 10 years ago. Uh, younger people need to be highly specialized, experiments are growing in complexity, and it's becoming progressively more difficult to keep this broad viewpoint, 
on common problems. So what would be the most important take home message that you think is for students from the story that you told today? What would you like to bring students not to forget uh, about uh, taking the example from the story that you told for planning their future? That would be really a very important message, I think, to learn from, from thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Well, I, I think um, we were driven by curiosity. And well, certainly, in the, even in the future, I think curiosity is the most important thing for us, for science to move ahead. So I hope that young students have their own curiosity to the nature. Thank you very much. This is really enlightening and inspiring. Um, we have one final question, which I would like to pass to you. Uh, again, thanks a lot for the very nice uh, talk. And the question is, do we have a robust explanation of neutrino mass source? We know that fermions gain mass through the Higgs interaction, but neutrinos have the right-handed absence puzzle. Okay, thank you. Well, certainly I'm, I'm, I'm an experimental physicist, therefore I'm not, I may not be the right person to answer to this question. But commonly, uh, people believe that the seesaw mechanism is the mechanism to generate very small neutrino mass. In this mechanism, um, there, are, there, there is, there is um, a very heavy neutrino-like particle. And because of this existence of the very heavy neutrino-like particle, the, as a result, the neutrino mass get very small. And well, I, 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 I also think this could, could be a very good explanation for the small neutrino mass. Okay, thank you very much. We have one final question. Uh, again, thank you for your presentation. Very interesting. And okay, I will reformulate it a little bit. Um, I, I, the, the question is, how long will be the data taking for Haber Kamakande planned to be such to obtain, how to say, uh, final results or breaking through breaking results? Thank you. Okay, thank you for this question. Um, well, well, Actually, hyper Kamiokande is a multipurpose detector. Um, of course, we are going to have the long baseline experiment using the accelerator beam. But in addition, uh, we are going to observe solar neutrinos, atmospheric neutrinos, and some other astrophysical neutrinos. So uh, the baseline is for accelerator-based uh, neutrino oscillation, oscillation experiment, uh, we are going to take 10 years of data. After that, we may extend the uh, um, data taking period. But anyway, initial assumption is for 10 years. But after that, we will continue the observation of solar neutrinos, atmospheric neutrinos, and so on. So we do not know how many years uh, we are going to take data. So many, many years. Okay, let me allow me one last question. I am, I would say, biased also for astrophysics or astro astroparticle physics. So hyper Kamiokande will have, of course, a great potential also uh, if a supernova happens uh, in our galaxy or nearby uh, in the science potential maybe also in the coincidence detection of supernovae not with, with gravitational waves. So what, what is your personal feeling with respect to uh, the science uh, potential in that area as well with instruments like Hyperkamakande in the future? Well, certainly, uh, uh, well, personally, uh, in fact, now uh, I'm involved in gravitational wave project, Kagra which is also located in Kamioka. And I'm very much looking forward to have a coincidence observation of neutrinos and gravitational waves. 
in the supernova explosion. And through these coincidence observations, I, I think uh, we would be able to understand the uh, mechanism of the supernova explosions very well. So I really want to observe the next generation, uh, no, sorry, next supernova explosion by neutrinos and gravitational waves. Okay, we all keep our finger crossed <laughs> because we are all looking forward to this next discovery. And meanwhile, there are more questions. So I would like to uh, pass to you one last question before uh, finishing and not keeping you too long today. Um, so again, thank you for your interesting presentation. And then now a cosmologic question. Do you think we can estimate the total amount of neutrino energy in the galactic volume for a galaxy like the Milky Way or another kind of galaxy? Total energy of neutrino in, in, in a galaxy. Well, okay, I think we, we should be able to estimate, but I'm sorry today, I don't have answer. But I, well, my, my, my answer is we should be able to estimate, yes. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for your colloquium today and for accepting our invitation. It was really very interesting. And I see that there are more questions coming, uh, but I think I don't want to keep you uh, very long today. And also thanks everybody for uh, in participating today and for the lively discussion. And um, let's all hope for the next break, break through breaking uh, announcement for on the community for neutrinos and coincidence observations, as well as, of course, a clarification on the puzzling uh, overview of CP violation and the future perspectives in the connections of particle physics to astrophysics and cosmology. So thank you everyone today and bye-bye. Okay, thank you very much. Bye-bye.